Ezekiel chapter 43. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. And his voice was like a noise of many waters. Revelation 1, 15, 14, verse 2. And the earth shined with his glory. Genesis 1. There was light before God said, let there be light. We've seen the temple. Now here comes God. So the temple is there before the Lord Jesus Christ comes. Because he is God. And it was, you know, shiny. He comes with fire out of his mouth. He comes with light. He says, I am the light of the world. And it was according to the appearance of the vision, which I saw even according to the vision, that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Shinar, Shebar. And I fell upon my face, Ezekiel 1, when he saw God. The cherubim. And the glory of the Lord, second advent, came into the house, chapter 10, verse 18, by the way the gate whose prospect is toward the east. So the Spirit took me up, Revelation 4, 1 through 16, and brought me into the inner court inside. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house. So Ezekiel is standing outside the house and the Lord speaking to him. This is exactly what happened to Solomon. This is exactly what happened with Moses when the glory of the Lord went into the tabernacle and men couldn't enter. It's going to happen again. He said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne. That's interesting. God's throne. Let's read on. Talk about Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. We see the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. We see verse 2, the glory of God of Israel. We're looking at the Trinity now. But let's get into one particular doctrine that is false among particular religions. He said to me, Son of man, the place of my throne, okay, and the place of the soles of my feet. God's a spirit, isn't he? Though so he says the earth is his footstool. Where I dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredom, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. There's going to be no more sin in Israel. They're not going to destroy God's holy name anymore. They're going to lift up the holy name. In their setting, of their threshold, by my threshold, and their post by my post, and the wall between me and them, they have even defiled my holy name by their abominations that they have committed, wherefore I have consumed them in my anger. Where is the old temple? It's gone. Where are the Jews? Dead. And in Babylon. And in Egypt. What is God with them? He is angry with them. If I can just say, he's sitting on the bed and Israel has his pants down with God holding a rod. He still loves them. What kind of father would be, all right, he takes the child, puts him over his knee and, and, and spanks him. And then, I don't want to have anything to do with you no more. He's not a father. Now, he may not want to talk to the child for a little while. 
And it'd be proper for the father to say, you know what? Hey, I just need to back away from you a little bit. I'm angry right now. I don't want to do anything stupid. You need to go settle down. You don't need to do anything stupid. You don't need to say anything stupid. Let's just have a little time away from each other so we both cool down. And this is what's going on with Israel right now. They're being punished. And they're going to be punished worse in the seven-year tribulation period. Right now, in Ezekiel's time, they've been destroyed. But yet, we're looking to the future when they will be redeemed. Now let them put away their whoredom. They haven't done it yet. And the carcasses of their kings. They don't have no kings today. Far from me. And I will dwell in the midst of them forever. How long forever? Thou son of man, show the house, the temple, to the house of Israel. That they may be ashamed of their iniquities. And let them measure the pattern, the blueprint. If they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house, and the fashion thereof, and the goings out thereof, and the comings in thereof, and all the forms thereof, all what we read already, and all the ordinances thereof, and all the forms thereof, and all the laws thereof. We haven't seen the laws. We've already read the law. And we studied Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers. And write it in their sight. That they may keep the whole form thereof. And all the ordinances thereof. And do them. So he's writing down what we're reading right now. In front of the nation of Israel. In Babylon. After they've already got word. It's been destroyed. Jeremiah is writing Lamentations. This is the law of the house. Uh-oh. Oh. So, verse 11, all the laws thereof. Yes, it's Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers, but this is the law of the house. Addition. Upon the top of the mountain, Zion, the whole limit thereof round about shall be most holy. Is Zion most holy today? Behold, this is the law of the house. Oh, here's a law. That Ezekiel's writing down in front of the Jews. And these are the measures of the altar. After the cubits. The cubit is a cubit and a hand breath. You measure from your elbow down. Even the bottom shall be a cubit. The breast a cubit, the border thereof by the edge thereof, round about shall be a span, and this shall be the higher place of the altar. The altar is up on, and from the bottom upon the ground, even the lower settle shall be two cubits. Now, the altar was divided in two, if you remember, studying Moses. In the middle of the brazen altar, there was a gate, a great net, of checker work, of, uh, of a, well, I can think it's like kind of a fence kind of thing, that, that was, was inside the altar. So when you put the meat upon it, like you have a barbecue, it's the grill. It separates what, what goes in the altar from falling all the way through the altar. The bottom upon the ground, even the lower settle, shall be two cubits. The breadth one cubit, and from the lesser settle, even to the greater settle, shall be four cubits. The breadth one cubit. So the altar shall be four cubits. From the altar and upward shall be four horns. The horns show up again. And the altar shall be twelve cubits long, twelve broad, square and four square thereof. Now Moses was five cubits by five by three. Solomon's was twenty by twenty by ten. Now we have twelve by twelve. The settle shall be fourteen cubits long and fourteen broad in the four squares thereof, 
and the border shall about it shall be a half a cubit. And the bottom thereof shall be a cubit about. His stairs shall look toward the east. So you climb stairs. That's quite an interesting because when you look at the law, it says you now should build an altar that you see the skirts. Now here are stairs. Now, 13 through 17, there's his measurements here, unless I draw it out on paper. I'm not going to great details. I, I can't draw it in these videos. If I could, I'd draw it and show you what it is, show you a picture. Larkin may have a good pictures on this. But do you see the measurements here? The detailed measurements that we've been reading through these chapters, that God says it, ha it has to be this big, this tall, this width. It has to be. So would you think that God wanted to celebrate holidays through an ordinance, you think he would tell us exactly what to do? You think that I can tell you what the measurements of an altar that has not yet, that if God wanted to tell us the birthday of his son, he'd tell us what it was. Don't, don't we have that much information? Aren't we told in Genesis 5 that this man lived a certain amount of years and then he gave birth to a son and he lived after a certain amount of years and he had sons and daughters and then he died a mountain this year? Don't we have that record? The birthday of Jesus, according to the Bible, yeah, it was a virgin birth. It had to happen, but as far as dating and numbers, there's no detail. And according to the law, eight days later, he was circumcised. And then we don't read about him till he's 12 years old. Funny. 12 cubits long, 12 broad. There's got to be something with the 5 cubits, 5 cubits, and 3. There's got to be something with a 20 by 20 by 10. What? I don't know. Everything in the Bible is by three. There's Moses. And there's something I, I, I missed the other night. Let me go back. My note was over here. In the Bible, there are seven temples. 1 Samuel, 1, 1 Samuel 9, there's the tabernacle. 1 Kings 6, there's Solomon's temple. Ezra chapter 4, it's rebuilt. Ezra's temple. John chapter 2 is Herod's temple. 2 Thessalonians 2 is the Antichrist temple. Ezekiel 41 is the Millennium temple. Revelation 21 is New Jerusalem. There are seven temples and we're given the measurements here of three. It's got to be something to it. And such detail by measurements. And the blueprints are in your King James 1611 Bible. I wouldn't trust a, a modern Bible if I had messed with the measurement. You might take a new modern Bible and try to put the temple together and find out that uh, slot A is missing slot B. Who knows? And he said unto me, Son of Man. Remember, the Son of Man is also the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus saith the Lord God. Now we've seen the Trinity here. These are the ordinances of the altar. We just read the law of the hell. Now we're on the altar. Now here's the ordinance. In the day when they shall make it. Who? Well, he said earlier... Uh, Verse 10, thou son of man, show the, house of, show the house to the house of Israel. Now he's saying to them, who's going to build this temple? I don't know. The ordinance of the altar in the day when they shall make it. So it's coming the day that this altar is going to be made. 
them is, is to the house of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon. The law is not done. It's, the law has been put away during the church age. But it's coming back. You know why Paul wrote to one of the churches about them going back to the law? You know why Satan would have you, oh, you got to be saved by the law? Because the law is coming back. When somebody said, you know, you got to do this in the law, the law said, yes, that's right, but not this day and period. Now, before the church age, yes. During the life of Jesus Christ, yeah. In the tribulation, yes. In the millennium, yes. But the church age, no. They don't have a temple. They don't have an altar. And the sprinkle of blood thereon. So blood is still shed in the millennium. And thou shalt give to the priests, the Levites. Oh, look at that. Go find yourself a Levite today. That be of the seed of Zadok. Oh, there you go. All right, go find a Levite. Now, go find one that's of Zadok. That makes it even harder. Which approach unto me. That's God saying, you're going to come unto me. These priests. No priest in the Old Testament. Yeah, they serve God, but God is going to be there in the millennium. God was a presence by cloud and by fire by night during Moses' time. Save the Lord God. A young bullock for a sin offering. This is the cleansing of the altar. And thou shalt take of the blood thereon, thereof, and put it on the four horns of it, and on the four corners of the settle. And that has to do with that, that grill. And upon the borders round about, thou shalt, thou, th thus shalt thou cleanse and purge it. Thou shalt take the bullet also for a sin offering. And shall burn it in the appointed place of the house without the sanctuary. Outside the sanctuary, there's a pointed place to burn the sin offering. And on the second day, thou shalt offer a kid of the goats without blemish for a sin offering. And thou shalt cleanse the altar as they did cleanse it with the bullet. Not a person. He said, well, didn't Jesus die for our sins? Didn't he shed his blood? Isn't he the high priest? Once sat down and God for... Where do you see a person here? It's a cleansing the altar. It's been made by man's hands. It's a piece of thing. When thou hast made an end of cleansing it. Did you get the it? I think my wife would be very upset if I could, if I kept on referring to her as it. Where's your wife? It is over there. Where's your spouse? It's over there. I don't think she would appreciate that. And if I refer to my daughter as it. Now you say your car. My car is over there. It is there. Thou shalt offer a young bullock without blemish. Now that's interesting because in the millennium the curse is removed. Did you know in the, in the Old Testament law that in the last week of Jesus Christ you were to take that Passover lamb and you were to ex examine it? You were to study it? You were to make sure that lamb was perfect for the offering? In the millennium you can just grab any animal and it's going to be perfect. It's going to be right. And the curse is gone. Except for a snake. 
and a ram out of the flock without blemish. Now, they're going to be pure colors. I mean, are you going to see spotted cows in the millennium? I don't know if they're spotted. Is a leopard still going to have its spots? Thou shalt offer them before the Lord. Exodus 29, 38. And the priest shall cast salt upon them. There's that salt offering. And they shall offer them up for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Okay. Ready? Seven days shalt thou prepare every day a goat for a sin offering. What's wrong with that one? What has changed? No. Not the Sabbath. Oh, it was a lamb. It was a lamb. It's no more a lamb. Do you remember when Isaac was let go? Do you remember what Abraham or Abram grabbed or Abraham grabbed instead of Isaac his son? Wasn't it a goat? So this daily sacrifice that used to be lambs is now a goat. Seven days thou shalt prepare every day a goat for a sin offering. They shall also prepare a young bullet and a ram out of the flock without blemish. Ready? Seven days thou shalt shall they purge themselves and purify themselves. It's not what it says. The lamb is sitting on the throne. The one sacrifice of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes him shall not perish. That sinless blood, that blood that's God's blood, Acts 20, 28, is sitting right there in Jerusalem upon his throne as the priests are doing their work and they're no longer offering lambs. Why? Who are the lambs in John chapter 10? They're Israel. And you think the shepherd's going to take his of his own kind and kill him? That would be a poor illustration. Here, grab my people and throw them in the fire in the millennium. Seven days thou shalt purge the altar and purify it. Why? It's got all this blood. It's got all this dung. And they shall consecrate themselves. They shall set themselves apart for the Lord to do the service of the tabernacle and the temple. And when these days are expired, it shall be that upon the eighth day, at the time when you are to circumcise a male child, and so forward. The priest shall make your burnt offerings upon the altar. Oh, they're going to bring burnt offerings. From the eighth day of the millennium and on. Your burnt offerings. Your peace offering. And I will accept you, saith the Lord God. So there is accountability of obedience in the millennium that does not show up in the church age. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saved. Now, I don't have to do anything and suffer and lose crown and get no rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. But in the millennium, the Jews and the people of the millennium are going to not only believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they got to obey the law and they got to bring sacrifice. They got to have works. Now, let me show you something. When you read about those works in the book of James, go to James chapter 1. And you read about faith without works is dead on that. But let's just look at James chapter 1 and we'll close. Let's get where he where let's get where James is talking about. James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren to the Jews, the twelve tribes. 
And then when you go into the faith and works and all that, it says, uh, verse 14 of chapter 2, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works, can faith save him? No. Verse 17, Even so faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, if a man say, Thou hast faith, and I, and I have works, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my work. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well, and the devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Today, I can look at a person. I can't judge them. Judge not, at least he be judged. But I can look at a person and judge them by their works. Whether I think or not, they're a Christian. If they don't have no works of, of Christ in them, I can honestly say 99%, I don't think you're saved. I think you're going to hell. Now, I don't know. If you don't have the works of what a Christian and what Christ has, your faith that you claim to have is dead because you have no works. Now, I can judge that. Corinthians, Paul tells us, we can judge things. I can judge your works. And I can say, you know what? Under the assumption, you're not saved. Or you're a terrible Christian by what you do by your works. Now, in the millennium, under the law, you can have faith in Jesus Christ. There he is. What else do you got to have besides your faith? You got to have the works. What are the works? You got to obey that law. You got to obey the ordinances. And you got to bring an animal. Now, what is faith? Look at Hebrews 11.1. 1. See, we're so much better than the law. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. For the evidence of things not seen. Does Hebrews 11.1 1 apply to the millennium? No. Why? Because there's Jesus. So. You see Jesus Christ. Where is the faith? There is none. There he is. So what do you got to have? You got to have works. You got to have the law. That's what the Jews have been founded upon since the very foundation of who they are after they came out and became a nation under Moses. Now I'm not talking about Abraham. I'm talking about when Moses brought them out as a nation and they went to Exodus chapter 20 and God said, listen, the Ten Commandments were verbally spoken to them. And they said, I forget what it was, uh, go back there and say, we're going to do everything God, God tells us to do. Which they shouldn't have. But they did. Now they never saw God. Faith follows them. They heard God. They seen the cloud. They seen the fire. I have seen no fire. I've seen no cloud. I've seen no Red Sea open up. They've seen the works of God and they had the law. And they had to bring animals. I have not seen Jesus Christ. I am trusting by faith. And what are my works? What's that? Bring an animal sacrifice? No, that's rest upon Jesus Christ. My works are to go in all the world and teach the gospel and bring the gospel to them that they may be saved and know that Jesus Christ saved and for Christians to do the same thing and to grow in the Lord from, from infant babies to the aged, as Paul said. My works is obedience to what God has told me to do because I believe in him outside of not seeing anything of God besides what he has worked in my life personally. Now, when I go witness to somebody, anybody's loss, what can I show them about salvation today in the church age? Absolutely nothing but my works. They can see in my life I've gotten victory over alcohol. I've gotten victory over smoking. I'm successful in my marriage. 
I am successful raising my children. I'm a God-honoring, Bible-preaching uh, Christian. I attend a Bible-believing church. I have a Bible that I read with my family. I do what the Bible tells me to do. I don't step outside of it. I don't go try to kill people. I try to get them saved through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. My works are backed up with the Holy Spirit and what God and the Lord Jesus Christ has told me because that's the only way they can see God outside of Israel. What and it's even said one of the, one of the prophets said if somebody goes into millennials, you know, they're going to preach Jesus, they're to be stoned. You don't need to preach Jesus in the millennium. There he is. You've got to have the works. Now, the day my faith ends is when I die or the rapture happens. That moment I see Jesus, Hebrews 11, 1, never follows from me again. Because the evidence, faith is the substance things hope for. I'm hoping for the Lord Jesus Christ. Once I see him, that hope is gone. Titus 2.13 is no longer my life birth. There he is. If I'm absent from the body, I'll be present with the Lord. If I'm raptured, I shall be caught up with them in the clouds and meet the one meet the Lord in the air. And the evidence of things not seen. Once I see Jesus, there you go. But rest assured, the tribulation period, you're not going to be saved. As a Gentile, because you beat the, 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 the beast, because you conquered his computer, you got an artificial chip in your arm and your right in your forehead to beat and all that and, and get you know, that's not how you get saved. How is a Gentile saved in the tribulation period? Taking care of the Jews. What's that called? It's called a work. And do you know what? They don't even know they're doing it. Matthew twenty five. What's the Jew doing to be saved in the tribulation period? Once he finds out that abomination is sitting where he ought not to be, they're running. You know what they're saying right at that point right there? They're acknowledging the second commandment. That's an idol, and we need to get out of here. Now, somewhere we heard, run. <laughs> I don't know where we heard that, but we heard, run. And go because worshiping an idol is against our religion, which they, which we've read. That's exactly what they've been doing. You know how God's going to get their butt for worshiping idols? He's going to put the Satan. He's going to put the devil. He's going to put the Antichrist in the holy of holies of their temple and open up the curtain, a door, whatever it is, and say, "How you doing?" And that's exactly what Jesus said. Once you see the abomination and desolation, run. How do you lose it if you're a Jew? You go back to your house. You turn back. You don't go running. Because you know what happens when you turn back? What's the Bible? What does Jesus say if you turn back? Remember Lot's wife. Did she make it to the mountain? No. And who got delivered? Just Lot. Now, I don't mean just Lot because his daughters went with him. I mean just as, in, as James said. He was justified. The works for the, for the Jew is getting away from those abominations, getting away from that ideology, and running to a place of refuge. Because what's going to happen? God's going to feed them in the wilderness again. Then here comes his son. Don't you think when you see a, a, a Jewish man coming on a horseback and all your enemies are being burnt up just like that, don't you think you're going to know there he is? That's what they wanted Jesus to do. It says, Hosanna, save us. Save us from who? The Roman government. That's what they want. You know why they put him on the cross? Because he didn't take the Roman government and beat their butt. He didn't make the Jews on top of the nation. He gave in to Pilate. He stood before, before Pilate silent. And Pilate said, I'm going to crucify you. And the Jews were like, he's a loser. That ain't the one. Oh, but when he comes back in that second advent, and he conquers all those and gets the goats from the sheep and casts those goats off, there he is. That's the one. Now, 
How are you going to prove your royalty? Your royalty? How are you going to prove your loyalty? How are you going to prove your love to him? There he is. You're going to bring your sacrifices to him. You're going to bring him to his holy temple. You're going to acknowledge his priest. That's There's going to be no fighting. Well, I think I'm a priest. No, there's going to be none of that. Wasn't there a family that rose up against Moses? Who do you think you are? Did his own brother and sister? Moses, who do you think you are? You ain't going to do that in the millennium. Your love to Jesus Christ in the millennium as a Jew, as a nation of nations, is you're going to show your love to Jesus Christ by obeying what he says to do as far as that temple worship. Now, as far as the Christians and the apostles running around, we've already showed our allegiance to Jesus Christ by not seeing Jesus Christ. What do you tell, go to John. What do you tell Thomas? John, Gospel of John's last, I think it's the last chapter. What do you tell Tom? He says, besides saying, Tom, stick your fingers in my hole. In the side. Uh, John chapter 17. Chapter 20. Verse 27. Then said he to Thomas, reach, th reach hither thy finger, behold my hands, reach hither thy hand, and thrust it in my side, and be not faithless. Don't you think at that moment the faith of Thomas is gone now? What faith does he have? He's standing there. He's got the holes in his side, doesn't he? He's got the hole in his hands, doesn't he? What faith would Thomas need now? It's gone. But believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, Jehovah Witness, my Lord and my God. He's got to believe. Watch this. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast, what? Seen me. What did Hebrews 11 one say? Remember that? Thou hast believed. Ready? Here's Hebrews 11, 1. Because they have not seen me, blessed are they that have not seen me, Hebrews 11, 1, and yet have believed. That's me. You know why I don't need to bring a sacrifice at the Millennium Temple as a Christian, as a bride of Jesus Christ? Because I have believed Jesus Christ, not seen him. There's a big difference between believing in Jesus Christ, believing in God, by seeing him and not seeing him. So when someone says, oh, show me God, no, you don't want that. Because if you were to have show me God as a religion, then you would have to have works. And when you read Paul writes to the Corinthians about that wilderness journey, even that, what God did for them, the manna, the, the rock, the flinty rock giving them water, the Red Sea opening up, the army of Egyptians gone, the, the, the waters turned sweet. And there were many, many, if not all above a certain age, that died in that wilderness because of unbelief, the Bible says, and Thomas had belief. You got to believe. Hebrews eleven said. Uh, Hebrews eleven eleven again says. Hebrews eleven. I want to quote this one correctly. Hebrews eleven says verse six. But without faith, it's impossible to believe to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The nation of Israel saw God, but they didn't believe and died in their sin. There are people today in the church age 
that have not seen God and have not believed God are going to die in their sins. There are people in the Old Testament who have seen God work. And they believe. And they have to do things. To show their obedience. There are people in the church age today. You, you don't see God. But you believe on what God has done for you. And works are not a means of salvation. It's a means to say you are saved. It's a testimony. It's a proven hate. I'm doing something because the love of God. The millennium is, there he is. I've seen God. There he is. Now, because of what he's done for me, because I'm in the millennium, he is now seated king of kings. He is now blessing us as a nation. I'm going to bring everything I can to bring him because I love him. That's what it's about. There he is. He's taking care of you. He's finally blessing you as a nation. And you're going to want to bring. Because you love what he's done for you. As God loved you, he gave himself. So when you do something for God, it's because you love him back for what he's done for you. It's not a sacrifice in the millennium. It's because I love you, Lord. It's not a sacrifice for me to do what the Bible. It's because I love the Lord. I owe it to him. 